I have. This is the sixth book so far, and most they all deal with American Revolution themes in one way or another, and most of them are focused on aspects of British soldiers or the British Army. But what I really like to tell people is they all focus on people more than on broader topics. So if you read a book of mine, you're likely to find a lot of individually named people in it. And as much as I can of the common people, I like the, the average soldiers and their wives and their children and people like that more than the senior officers and the politicians. Sure, I, that, that, that makes it so interesting. I've always thought that uh, it's it just really impossible for a person to imagine themselves as George Washington or something like yeah. that. Right, much easier to imagine oneself as a farmer, a shopkeeper, an assistant in a, in a store working and, and, and to, uh, uh, someone and, uh, who's picked up a gun. Well, that's exactly right. We talk about, we love to talk about the army and how many men were in the army, but then we tend to talk only about the general. We look at the, the soldiers just as an amorphous blob of men with a number ascribed to it. And I like to say, well, who were all those individual people? You know, they all came from somewhere. They all had their time in the army and then they all went somewhere afterwards. And who were they? Why, why did they come in? What did they do? They certainly all had individual stories if we can only find them. Sure, sure. All right, well, good evening. I'm Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm near near Boston. And with me tonight in Virginia is? Carrie, Someone with their microphone on mute. You might be muted. OK, let's try this. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm Carrie Lynn the director of the Pursuit of History. And we are excited tonight to have with us Don Hagist. Don is the managing editor of the Journal of the American Revolution. His specific areas of expertise include British operations in Rhode Island, demographics of the British Army, and wives of British soldiers. He has written six books and several articles in academic journals. His most recent book, Noble Volunteers, The British Soldiers Who Fought the American Revolution, is the topic of our discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Don. No, oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, Don, we're going to dive in in just a second. I want to remind people, mark your calendars for May 15th. We're not going to tell you quite why, but uh, you'll find out soon enough. All right, Don. So I think like most folks know that uh, the Great Britain had one of the most professional, experienced, one of the most capable armies. Set the stage for us as as conflict is brewing here and, and men are setting sail and coming to America. Okay, that's a great way to, to, to start the conversation because I remind people that a large portion of the British soldiers who fought in the American Revolution did not come to America to fight in a war. They came to America before a war began and their mission was to prevent a war, not to fight a war. So at the time war broke out in Boston, there were soldiers who had been there for a minimum of about 10 months, and some of them had been in America for almost 10 years at that point. These were professional soldiers who had joined the Army as a career, and this service in America was just one portion of a career that might have spanned, in some cases, 30 or 40 years as a soldier. Well, Don, so... The, the the ten year number is a surprise. Give us a, a better sense about uh, how large was that group, kind of proportionally, perhaps, and and what their original uh, what they're originally tasked with. All right. Um, well, remember that America was a set of British colonies. There were actually more than thirteen British colonies in North America because. Quebec was a British colony, Nova Scotia was a British colony, there were several British colonies in the Caribbean at that time. But 13 of those colonies were in some state of rebellion. Um, the American, the rebellion actually began long before fighting broke out. So we have a revolution that was followed by a war, and, and we often conflate the two of them. But really, Massachusetts had rebelled against certain aspects of British rule in 1774, open rebellion after a lot of resistance for 
for about a decade. Now, because Great Britain was a set of, I mean, because America was a set of British colonies, it was routine for them to have some amount of soldiers here, and as, as any empire would have out on their fringes. As things grew tense in Massachusetts, a lot of the soldiers that were already in different parts of North America were moved into Massachusetts. So you had a couple of regiments that had been in New Jersey in 1774 and in New York that were sent to Boston, a couple of regiments that had been in Quebec since 1767. They were sent down to Boston, some soldiers from Florida, and um, a little later in the war, even soldiers who had been in the West Indies were moved into Florida. So a lot of these soldiers had at least some experience in America. There were also some that had been in America maybe earlier in the decade, been sent back to Great Britain, and then were sent back to America yet again. But by April of 1775, when hostilities broke out, there were about 6,000 troops in Boston, and they were all professional soldiers. They were all men who had joined the army as a career. And when you join the army as a career during this time period, that means you serve until you're no longer fit for service. And fit for service in the British infantry means that you're fit enough to be able to leave Boston at about 10 o'clock at night and walk from there to Concord, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles, carry out some activities there, and then walk all the way back to Boston while fighting with people, um, all in a 24-hour period. Um, it means you're able to live out in a tent for an entire summer, camping on the ground, sometimes wrapped only in your blanket, march long distances, carrying a heavy load. So with these conditions, a soldier who joined the army in his early 20s, the majority of the British soldiers who served in America, enlisted somewhere between the ages of 21 and 23. Of course, that's if we did that as a distribution that would have long tails. Some soldiers joined as young as 15, others joined when they were in their 30s, but most of them joined in the early 20s. And then they might serve until their late 40s or early 50s in the army. So you have men now who are in the army for 20 to 30 years. The American Revolution is a war that lasts for eight years. And you can see that this war, for those who served the entirety of it, it was still only a small part of a much longer career in the army. So give us a sense of the, of the backgrounds of some of the men that joined the army and, and their motivation to become a professional soldier. Yeah, this gets into a big challenge that we have because uh, I can give you some background of the men in terms of nationalities, in terms of the kinds of things they did before they joined the army. But when we talk about motivation, we run into a real problem. I, I always tell people that the data that we have tells us what, but it doesn't tell us why. So we have a great deal of data about which men were in the army, when they joined, how old they were, how long they served. But when we ask why did they join, for that we have only a tiny, tiny amount of data. Because I only trust the cases where somebody wrote down their actual reason for joining the army as telling me why they joined. I don't want to just make assumptions, and I'll show you in a minute why. I'm going to give you some specific examples. Um, if, if I can ramble on this topic for a minute, Please. there were four ways that you could get into the British Army during this time period. I'm talking now the 1760s and 1770s. One way to get in the Army was to enlist voluntarily, and that's why this book has this title, Noble Volunteers. We'll talk more about that in a second. So you could enlist voluntarily. You could be born in the army. Career soldiers have children and they might want to join the army as well. There was also a way that you could get into the army as an alternative to going to prison. And it was also possible to get in the army by a thing called impressment, compulsory service, where you, you've heard about press gangs and whatnot. Well, an important thing, and again, we discuss all these things in great detail in the book, these different types of, of getting into the army, but Impressment in particular gets a lot of press. You find a lot about it in the literature. And that's unfortunate because hardly any men who served in the American Revolution were pressed into the army. 
It was not legal for the army to press men until 1778. Now, remember when the war started, 1775, and we have all these soldiers already in the army. It wasn't legal to press men into the army until 1778, and then the law was repealed again in 1780. So there was only a two-year period when it was even possible to impress men. During that time period, only about 10% of the men recruited into the army, not 10% of all the men in the army, but 10% of the recruits were pressed into the service. Of all those recruits during those two years, only a few hundred ended up serving in America. So if you're studying the American Revolution in Boston in 1775 and 76, the dramatic campaigns in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania in 1776 and 77, and even into the first half of 1778, there were no pressed men in the British Army at all. And then when you finally get into 1779, 1780, you have a few of them. The most I found in any regiment, a regiment being about 500 men, is about 39 pressed men in a regiment out of 500. So the amount of men who were in it by impressment is trivial, and yet it gets a lot of um, a lot of writing devoted to it, which is unfortunate because it mischaracterizes the army. Same with this thing as an alternative to prison. A man who had committed petty crimes, not violent crimes, but things like petty theft, um, bigamy, failure to pay child support, those sorts of crimes could be offered the opportunity to join the army instead of going to prison. It was still the man's own choice. It wasn't something he was forced to do. And the army had the right to either accept or not accept those men. So they would only take men into the army in this way if they were suitable to be soldiers. And there too, in the course of the entire American Revolution, we find only a few hundred cases of men who went into the army. And of those, only a subset came to America. So, so these two harsh ways of going to the army, alternative to prison and impressment, make up only a tiny fraction of the British soldiers who served in America, which leaves the other way to get into the army, which was volunteering. <clears throat> so to your question, why would a man volunteer? Well, what do you think? Turns out the army had some pretty persuasive reasons to join. One was um, it was steady work. It paid, it didn't pay great, but it paid consistently. Um, it guaranteed a lot of things like pay, food, and clothing that a laborer's job might not um, guarantee. And if you served for a long time in the army, it had one very innovative thing for the time period. British soldiers could get a pension after they had served until they were no longer fit for service. Now, unfortunately, again, we don't have any data that we don't have any accounts of men who wrote down and said, I joined the army because I wanted that pension after 20 years. So it was an incentive, but I can't say how many men joined because of that incentive. Um, now, would you like to hear some reasons for why people joined? I we, Yes, I know we would. All right, give me just a moment. I'm gonna share my screen, but I have to get it to the right screen here. I'm. Uh, Looking at some, I have some PowerPoint slides which have this data on it, and I've got some reasons. Um, unfortunately, in all the time I've been doing research for several decades on this topic, I've only been able to find 35 soldiers who wrote down their specific reason why they joined the British Army. And as I've said, if I don't have an exact reason that once somebody wrote and told me, I don't like to say why I think they might have joined because that's a guess. And when I show you the reasons why they actually joined, you'll see what I mean by that. Let's see if I can do the screen sharing properly here. Share screen, find the right screen. It's this one. I'm gonna read these off, but they'll be on the screen as well if you want to see them. We have a man named William Crawford who joined the 12th Dragoons in the early 1770s. And that's, that was a regiment that did not come to America but he then volunteered to lead the cavalry and go into an infantry regiment that did serve in America. And he said, he was an Irishman, he said it was the king's golden guineas in the form of a bounty that won my heart. So he liked that enlistment bounty, which was equal to about a month and a half's pay at that time. 
Then we have a man, if we can get a response here from the screen, Robert Hudson joined the 20th Regiment because he said, well, he was also in Ireland. He said, by the fair speeches of British officers, they brought us to believe that the army was the best place. So recruiters gave him a really good pitch. John Pink joined the 33rd Regiment in Yorkshire. He said he was persuaded by a young man belonging to the army that it was a very advantageous place for a tailor. John Pink was a tailor. He was steadily employed, but he was told that he could do even better as a tailor in the army. And it turns out he was right. And again, the book talks a lot about this, the role tailors had in the army. Uh, Robert Hall joined the 43rd Regiment, not from want, but from inclination. And this, we'll start to see a theme here. William Burke said, I had a wish to become a soldier. A man whose first initial we know is W. Griffith said, I could not resist it, although I could give no particular reason. Now think of this. These are young men. They've perhaps been working as a trade since they were maybe as young as seven or eight years old, more likely in their early teens. They've gone through an apprenticeship. Now they're in their early 20s, and they may be really, really tired of being a, a weaver or a farmer or a wool comber or what have you. And the army is going to give these men an opportunity to, to travel and do things, the kinds of things that they might never get to do otherwise. Thomas Sullivan said he had joined the army to satisfy an inclination strongly bent on rambling. Um, a Scottish soldier named Andrew Scott uh, joined the army because it afforded me an opportunity of seeing the world. Again, these are still the reasons why people voluntarily enlist in the army, right? Valentine Tuck Duckett joined the 65th Regiment because he said, my stepmother and I could not agree. Well, there's a story that's probably never happened since, right? The uh, father remarries, the son doesn't get along with his stepmother, he runs off, he joins the army. Jonathan Sawyer enlisted because he was disappointed in courtship. And uh, John Andrew joined the army to be freed from the clamors of a wife. Now, you see some themes in here, but the really important thing to recognize is that the only way you could figure out any of these reasons is, is if the men told us themselves, if they wrote down why they joined. We couldn't do anything like look at the economic situation in the region at the time or other demographic data and, and deduce any of these reasons. Now, it's only 35 that I have. This is a subset of them. They're all, the other ones are similar. Every single man I have who wrote down his reason why he joined the army had a job or he had some means of support at the time he chose to enlist. So it's possible that a lot of men joined the army because they couldn't find other work, but I haven't found a case where a man said that that was his reason yet. Again, 35 out of thousands of men who joined, it's not a statistical sample, but it does give us some insight, at least to why some of these men joined the army. John, that's fascinating. And, 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 and the, I'm so glad you brought that up on the screen. The detail is, uh, is, is perfect in their own words. And, you know, I should have explained at the outset, if people hadn't gathered, you are perhaps the foremost authority on uh, the British army in America. And, we are so fortunate to have you and, and the uh, you spent, as you mentioned, just casually in passing decades doing this research. And uh, it's the kind of thing that you showed that uh, it's really so very interesting. Well, uh, I appreciate that. And out of modesty, I'll say that I don't know that I'm the expert on the British Army, because if you ask me a lot of questions about the careers of the generals and the senior officers, if you ask me a lot of questions about the logistics and the supply chain and the administration, I might not have those. But if you ask me about the common soldiers and the individual men oh, no. wearing carrying the muskets and wearing the red coats, there I will accept the mantle of expertise. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, tell us geographically where these men were drawn from and, uh, and, and to what extent the the men who who came to the colonies came directly from England or from, um, I mean, you mentioned some of the other colonies, but prior to arriving in the colonies, where might they have served? Okay, that's a great question. And you, you asked actually two separate questions in there. One was, 
where they came from, which I'll take as to where they were born, and the other was where they may have served. So there's two separate factors there. In terms of where they came from, that's the easy one to answer because we have some hard data that shows us that. Um, the operational entity in the British Army is called a regiment. And as I mentioned, that it, the size of regiments changed during the war. And of course, none of them were ever equal in size exactly. But if you think of a regiment as being about 500 men, that gives you a pretty good rough idea when you see that term during this time period. So in these regiments, if you were to sample the men statistically, everyone would have a slightly different national mix. They, each regiment did its own recruiting and the demographic mix within it in some ways reflected that some sent their recruiting officers here and some sent them there. But for the most part, it would average out to a regiment being about half Englishmen. Remember, we're in Great Britain now, so we have England and we have Scotland and we have Ireland um, and we have Wales, of course. You'd find in most British regiments about half Englishmen, about half Scotsmen, and about half Irish. Now, those proportions will vary. Some have only like 5% Irish and maybe 35% Scottish and 50 or 60% English and some some have other shifts like that. But in general, you're talking a pretty good sampling of all over the British Isles. During this time period, British regiments did not recruit regionally. Most of them didn't. So we have um, right at the end of the American War, regiments got these things called county titles. So a lot of people think of British regiments and they say, oh, oh you must mean the the South Staffordshire Regiment or the West Riding Regiment or the Cheshire Regiment. Like, well, those titles weren't given to regiments during this time period or not right till the very end of it. All these regiments, with a couple of exceptions here and there, recruited from all over Great Britain. So when I say a regiment was 50% English, if you then broke that down and looked at the 50% of the men, the 250 or so, you'd find them from all over the British Isle. You'd probably find at least one from every single county. You might find some concentrations from different places, depending on how that regiment chose to recruit. But for the most part, quite a distribution. As the war went on, some recruiting was done in Germany. So you suddenly find a lot of Europeans, about 2,000 or so German recruits were put into British regiments. These are not the Hessians, which came over as entities of armies from German states. These were individuals who enlisted into the British army, wear red coats and serve in the ranks of British regiments. Some regiments had only two or three European nationals. Some had as many as a hundred. Again, the book talks more about this. There were language issues, but the British army knew how to deal with language issues because they had a lot of Scotsmen and a lot of Irishmen who also didn't speak English as their native tongue. So they managed these kind of things. Again, we, we there's a lot of material about how these things were dealt with in the book. But it was a pretty diverse force is what it amounts to. It, it's not a case like later on in the British Army's history where a regiment all came from a, a single region. Rather, in any given regiment, you had quite a nice mixture of soldiers. I didn't talk about where men may have served beforehand <laughs> in all that, but regiments moved from place to place in Great Britain during peacetime, and they also went on foreign service during peacetime. So a regiment might be stationed at a British uh, colony like Gibraltar or a British holding like Gibraltar, and then get sent from Gibraltar back to Great Britain and then to Nova Scotia for a year, few years, back to Britain and to Menorca for a few years, and then eventually back to America. So many of these soldiers had been in a few other places uh, before they came to America. And many of them went on to other places after they left America. What was the perception? And, and, and after this, by the way, I want to get into some stories of specific individuals that will probably uh, be really bring all this to life. But was the perception that America was a, a good place to be sent or, uh, or, or would you much rather have gone to Nova Scotia or Gibraltar or, or whatever? 
Well, this is the hard part again because very few British soldiers wrote down that information. There are a good few officers who wrote down more things, and I don't study the officers so much, so I'm not prepared to give their perspective. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. The case where we see that the British soldiers didn't mind America is, in many ways, the climate was similar. Um, you could talk to the locals easily enough because the language was generally the same. There was a fair amount of opportunity here. There were places where there were attractive women. And many sold, British soldiers did get married in America to American women. Some took their wives back to Great Britain with them. Others stayed in America instead. But um, there's no perception that America was seen as a bad place to go in general. But the idea of fighting a war here was abhorrent to a lot of men. There was a lot of anger in the British army about the idea that some of British citizens would rebel against the crown. Again, these remember that British um, American colonists were rebelling against their government, which tends to be something we don't take very lightly these days, and turns out it wasn't taken very lightly then. Um, the British soldiers that stayed in Boston before the war even began were treated very poorly by the local citizens. And there were some good reasons why the citizens did this, but it led to a lot of animosity and a lot of tension between the citizens and the soldiers. I cover this in a lot of detail in the early part of the book and the tensions that rose. And it's hard for us to decide that those tensions then contributed to how the British soldiers behaved after hostilities broke out but it's hard to ignore that possibility, too, that these soldiers who were sent to a place to keep the peace and protect local citizens from a war breaking out were then treated like hostile invaders. So now they have a very different attitude about the people they're supposed to be protecting who clearly don't want them here at all. Well, Don, take us through some stories of individual men. I will take you through some stories. I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to tell you stories about four individual British soldiers. And I've picked these four almost random. I tell people over and over that the difficult thing about coming up with a few stories of British soldiers to show is singling out just the few, because I have hundreds and hundreds of stories like these. Benjamin Noble joined the British Army. Oops, got to get the slide to work properly here. He was born in 1748 in Sandwich, Bedfordshire. He was a laborer, and as far as I can tell, he was illiterate, at least in as much as he was not able to write his own name. And he enlisted in the 14th Regiment of Foot in 1765. So you can see he was a little on the young side. He was 17 when he joined the Army. And he was sent to Nova Scotia in 1766. So he goes to North America almost immediately. And then two years later, he was sent to Boston. He was in Boston at the time of the Boston Massacre, but his regiment was not involved in any way. Then from Boston, they were sent down to the West Indies. And Benjamin Noble saw war for the first time in 1773 in a war that's largely forgotten today called the Carib War but there were a fair number of British soldiers who served in America who got their first experience in combat in this war. And Benjamin Noble was one of them, he was wounded. Then his regiment was sent to Virginia. And in 1775, he served in another battle, this time in the American Revolution, a little known battle called Great Bridge, which is not well remembered, but it was very important at the time. So he was wounded a second time in Virginia at the Battle of Great Bridge. Now he's got 10 years in the Army, two wounds. His regiment gets sent back to Great Britain, the 14th Regiment, but he's still an able-bodied soldier. He's young. He has recovered from his wounds. So he gets put into a different regiment that's staying in America, the 44th Regiment of Foot. <clears throat> and he goes into the Grenadier Company. The picture here, by the way, is from the Carib War. Um, but now it's 1776, right at the very beginning, he's sent to the 44th Regiment of Foot. He's among a bunch of new recruits and transfers being sent to this regiment. And the regiment happens to be in New Jersey at this time at a place called Trenton. 
which has recently been liberated from Washington's army across the, across the Delaware. His men are on the way to join the 44th Regiment, and they come into a town called Princeton, New Jersey, on January 3rd, 1777. They march right into the Battle of Princeton, where Benjamin Noble is wounded for a third time. Well, you would think that having now 12 years in the army and three wounds in battle in two different wars and three different places would be enough to have somebody sent home, but these were career soldiers. Benjamin Noble served in the army. He continued through 1790, um, and eventually he received a pension at that time. And you can look at this and say, my gosh, what a career he had. Sadly, he didn't write anything down about it. He must have had some great stories to tell. But this kind of thing is a very common story for the British soldiers who fought in the American Revolution. Peter Faderheim, that name doesn't sound very British because it's not. He was born in Mannheim, Germany in 1758. We know he was five foot nine inch tall, light brown hair, gray eyes, fresh complexion, and he was a Lutheran. And he was one of these German nationals I talked about who was recruited for British service in 1775, just after the American Revolution began, when it became apparent that this would be a long war and a lot more recruits were needed for it. He joined the 17th Regiment of Foot in America. This regiment was in the Battle of Princeton, but he himself just managed to miss it. But he was captured at Stony Point in 1779. He spent about 18 months as a prisoner of war, then he was exchanged, and then he was captured again at Yorktown in 1781. Spent about another two years as a prisoner of war, and then was exchanged or repatriated when the war ended. But he then advanced through the ranks of the British Army. He wasn't discharged until 1802 when he received a pension. So now he had put in uh, 27 years in the Army, he ran pretty high, but he was only 44 years old. What do you suppose a guy like this does at this time? He does what thousands of British soldiers did, perhaps a majority of British soldiers did in these circumstances. He joined the army again. He enlisted in the 60th Regiment of Foot. He served for another four years. He went back on the pension rolls. And then what does he do? He does what British soldiers do. He joined the army again. This time he goes into a, an organization called a veteran battalion that serves only in Great Britain. He's no longer fit for marching long distances or going overseas, but he can serve in the national defense if necessary. And he's finally discharged for the last time, as far as I know, in 1810. And again, there's nothing the least bit unusual about this career for a British soldier. Um, by the time he's discharged, he signed his name as Peter Featherham, which shows he was completely anglicized after his long service in the British Army. And this is his signature from 1802 from the 17th Regiment. Again, we can trace his career through a lot of different documents. He didn't leave any of his own writings that we know of, but imagine the stories he could have told. Thomas Plum, here's a guy who did leave a writing. He was born in Cornwall, which, as you know, was in England. We know he was married. He had a wife of child who stayed in Cornwall. We'll see why in a minute. He joined the 22nd Regiment of Foot in 1765, came to Boston in June of 1775 with his regiment. So he's another 10-year veteran when he arrived here. And his regiment was sent to Rhode Island, where they garrisoned for three years, and where I live, where I am right now. Um, and when he was in Rhode Island, he wrote this letter home. And at the end of the letter, he wrote, um, my kind respects to my loving wife and child, Uncle Wood, Molly, and little William, and all inquiring friends. And that's just lovely, isn't it? The letter survives in the British National Archives, which is really cool. And it's very remarkable to study a man like this and then be able to hold a letter that he held. And it's also a little sad to read this signature and then find out that he was killed a year later in the Battle of Rhode Island on August 29th, 1778. Here's his signature at the bottom, Thomas Plum, soldier, 22nd Regiment, Captain McDonald's Company. Um, we've done three. There's one more here we'll go through if you haven't had enough yet. James Cuff, 
1755, Ireland, six feet tall, light hair, light complexion, a barber before he joined the army. He enlisted in the 62nd Regiment in May of 1774, so he's 19 years old. And he, the 62nd Regiment was on Burgoyne's campaign. James Cuff was among the men who was captured. All those prisoners were sent to the Boston area, and he escaped from prison. Well, that seems like an interesting to do. And then he turned around and he enlisted in the 16th Massachusetts Regiment in February 1778. Ah, so he's been smitten by the cause of liberty, right? He must be turned into a patriot. Well, maybe not. He deserted in 1779. So maybe he's not such a patriot. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. He came back. In October 1793, he, he went back into the 16th Massachusetts Regiment. All right, so he's fighting for the cause of liberty. He's in Bergen County, New Jersey in 1780 at somewhere near Newbridge, and he deserted again. Okay, maybe he's not such a patriot after all. He deserted on 11 September between Paramus and Newbridge, and then he got into the British lines in New York where he joined the British Army again on September 14, 1780. So this guy seems pretty opportunistic, doesn't he? Again, this happens to quite a lot of soldiers on both sides. The number of men who fought in both armies during the American Revolution is surprisingly high. And the number who didn't just leave one and make a full commitment to the other was surprisingly high. James Cuff's regiment went back to Great Britain at the end of the war in 1783. And there... He deserted again in June of 1784. After that, I don't know what became of him. I sure wish I did. Because there's another man who probably has some really great stories to tell, if only they had been recorded. Um, this, again, this is four men out of about 50,000 British regular soldiers who served during the American Revolution. I've got lots and lots and lots of stories like these. So singling out such a small number of them is really tough. But I hope you like them. John, that's fascinating. And and again, a, a testament to your original research, and, and we're here, all, all the beneficiaries of it. Uh, after the war, what happened to the British soldiers that were in America? Ah, that's a good question. Lots of different things. Again, this is where I stress the book is called The British Noble Volunteers, The British Soldiers Who Fought in the American Revolution. There's a few other books that say The British Soldier. And that sounds like they're trying to say, okay, there was only one, and they were all the same. And I like to write about how these men were different from each other, not how they were the same. So there were lots of different options. Um, many of the men who served in the American Revolution were career soldiers, as I've said, but there were some who enlisted and they were allowed to serve only for the duration of the war. When the war ended, the army was now, the army that had not been big enough at the beginning of the war and did a lot of recruiting. Now, 1783, it's peacetime again. The army doesn't need to be as big. So a lot of men were discharged. Some men who were discharged stayed in America by their own choice. Um, some men went back to Great Britain, were discharged there, and they went on to the pension rolls. And the book describes, talks about the pension system and some of the kinds of experiences pensioners had after the war. Some men got land grants in Nova Scotia. Here was another incentive for joining the army after the war began. The army said, well, if you serve in the war, when the war is over, we'll give you a land grant in America. And if you're a Scottish laborer who has the prospect of spending your entire life working somebody else's land, the idea of getting 100 acres of your own land just in exchange for serving for a few years in the army. That's a really strong incentive. So men took land grants in Canada. A surprisingly high number of men who were discharged from the army at the end of the war and had the option of doing anything they wanted turned around and re-enlisted in the army. And we talk about that even with some statistics in the book. So there were a lot of different paths these men might take. As I said, some men were early in their military careers and served another 30 years into the early 1800s. They fought in other wars. Um, some of them were right at the end of their careers. And, and we've got some examples of men who did settle in America, others who settled in Canada, others who went back to Great Britain and, and lived out their days on the pension rolls. 
Well, that's very interesting. I, I think Carrie's going to join us in just a second. I know we have other questions, but I'm going to ask a very quick one because I'm sure several people have the same question. What, is, right. that interesting, what is that interesting map just over your shoulder? Oh, that interesting map, um, that is Narragansett Bay in 1777. Um, if you look at a map of Rhode Island, it's rectangular, and that's got sort of a gouge out of it that's Narragansett Bay. And um, it goes all the way up to the city of Providence at the very top of it. So that map was done by a British cartographer and published in 1777. It's the part of the war that I like to study the most. <laughs> um, I try to zoom in on it, but I'd probably drop it and knock the camera over and everything else. But you get the idea. <laughs> well, John, this has just been fascinating. Carrie, do you want to join us? All right. We have a viewer who would like to know about the Ethiopian regiment. Were they forced to join or why would they have enlisted? That's a great question. I'll start with the caveat that I'm not an expert on that because the Ethiopian regiment was not part of what we call the regular army. They were a loyalist regiment. The British army raised a lot of regiments in America just for the war. And this, this was part of the way that the British colonial system worked. If there was a war going on anywhere in the British Empire, India, Gibraltar, America, some professional soldiers who were part of the full-time army went there, but then they also raised regiments from that location, from that region. The Ethiopian regiment was raised in Virginia in 1775 by Lord Dunmore, who was the British colonial governor of Virginia. It was in response to rebellious activity in Virginia. He needed soldiers just like Boston needed soldiers. And he issued a proclamation that said any slaves who come over to the British government and agree to serve in the army will be granted their freedom in return for their service. And sure enough, a bunch of slaves came and were outfitted. Um, I don't have a lot of detail on how this regiment operated. Again, it was not part of what we call the regular army, uh, but they but it was a legitimate regiment. They did serve for a while, but unfortunately they were devastated by smallpox and other diseases um, early on, shortly after they were raised. Um, it's a fascinating story that's a little bit out of my own area of expertise. But the incentive was manumission. They were, they were granted their freedom if they served in the army. Okay, thank you. All right, are there recorded incidents of American loyalists providing specific protections for British soldiers, similar to maybe the Underground Railroad providing protection for slaves during the 19th century? Oh, there sure are. Um, large numbers of British soldiers were captured during the war. Some were captured in Canada right at the beginning of the war. Then we had this army, General Burgoyne's army, captured in 1777. Um, there were Scottish Highlanders captured in Boston Harbor in 1776, and then, of course, prisoners captured at Yorktown in 1781, in addition to a lot of other cases of smaller numbers being captured here and there. And these soldiers who were captured escaped in droves, and in droves they made their way through American lines, through the American frontier, and got back into the British Army. And amazingly, some of them did record even sometimes only a paragraph, sometimes a little more about their experience. But the one guy who wrote a lot of detail about it was a British soldier named Roger Lamb. He was captured at Saratoga, escaped, joined the British Army, was captured again at Yorktown, escaped again, joined the British Army, got back to Ireland, wrote two books about his experience. And he included a lot of other things in those books, so I took them and I abridged them into a single account that just tells his about his experience as a soldier. And he talks a great deal about his time as a fugitive. The book is called A British Soldier's Story, Roger Lamb's Narrative of the American Revolution. It's out of print right now, but barring mishaps within the next 18 months, it will be back in print. Um, but the answer is yes, there absolutely was an extensive network of loyalist Americans who helped British soldiers, British escaped prisoners of war, make their way back into British lines. 
It's something that okay, really great. should be more written about it than already has been. All right. Now, if soldiers' families were with them, or if they married locals, what type of housing would be given to the families? And did those families follow the regiments around? Okay, that's a great question. The answer is it varied a great deal. So in general, British soldiers could be married and could have their wives with them in places where the regiment traveled. Conditions in peacetime and wartime varied a great deal. Um, if we think of this regiment of about 500 men, then we also want to say it includes about 80 wives of soldiers. Um, I am working now on a book of all about wives of British soldiers, so I'll be able to answer in more detail in the future. But the answer is yes, wives and families could follow regiments around to some extent. Um, if an army was in garrison, a town like New York, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, Philadelphia for a short time during the war, Charleston, South Carolina toward the end of the war, um, the army might have space in barracks for the wives or it was perfectly reasonable for the wife and the family to take lodgings nearby and the soldier might or might not be allowed to stay with his family in their own, in whatever housing they could rent in the area. The book has some examples of this. I have a lot of information about where the soldiers lived and some discussion about the extent to which wives and families could live with them too. But the bottom line is on almost every campaign, there were at least a few wives and families with the regiment living in the tents. Any town, you'd find wives and children living at a minimum in their own private lodgings nearby where the regiment stayed, if not in the same quarters as the regiment itself. Okay. And did any of the soldiers stay behind after the war to help rebuild the nation? I am guessing they all went on to other assignments. Uh, well, we, I talked about that a little bit in the earlier part of my discussion. Um, and I'm gonna divide that up and take out the phrase help rebuild the nation because that's a little bit <laughs> out of scope. Settled in America is, is where I'll leave it at that. But the answer is yes, some British soldiers stayed in America after the war and settled here. I do talk about some of them in this book, and I talk about a few of them in one of my other books called British Soldiers, American War, because some of these people left detailed accounts. Um, the challenge we face is that once a man leaves the army, it's hard to know where he went unless we find that information anecdotally. So I can go to British military records and see all the men who served in the army and exactly when they left. And I can see that in America, for example, in 1783, the British, uh, the 22nd Regiment discharged 66 men in New York before they went back to Great Britain. So the regiment said, you guys, if you want to, you can leave the army right here in New York. And 66 of them said, yep, we're doing it. We're leaving right now. Well, on the surface, you could say, wow, 66 men stayed in New York. But if we look deeper in records, we find that 47 of those 66 men re-enlisted the very next day into a different British regiment that was going to Canada. So they didn't really leave the army at all, even though they had the opportunity. Well, there, just by good luck, we have some continuity in the records. But there's a lot of other men, the other 16 out of those 66, the 19, whatever it looks out to be, I don't know what happens to them. All I know is they're not in the army anymore. Then it gets really hard to trace them. Every once in a while, I'll find some record somewhere of a man, but there's no comprehensive source that we can go to that lists out all the men and says where they settled. Some of them could have signed in onto a ship and sailed to the West Indies or to the other side of the globe for all I know. Some of them could have found their own passage back. So just because a man left the army when he was in America, doesn't mean he settled here. I do have a lot of stories of men who settled here, but we, there's no way to estimate the number who settled in America. Okay. And do you have any stories of how the British soldiers who were prisoners of war were treated? I do. I have a lot of them right in this book. I have a lot of them in my book, British Soldiers, American War. And there's another book by a colleague of mine, 
that came out recently called, I can't remember the title of it, but it came out last year and it deals with very specifically with prisoners of war on both sides during the war and how they were treated. In general, the British soldiers were treated, I'm going to say reasonably well, but that has to be in the context of being in the 18th century and being a prisoner. Um, some, um, the Americans built some prison camps and they held some prisoners of war in jails, depending on when and where. And jails were not very nice places in the 18th century. Even the nice jails were not very nice by compared to standards today. So a fair number of British soldiers died in captivity. Um, some of them got long-term disabilities from their time in captivity. And some of them bore out the captivity fairly well and then got back into the army and stayed in it for decades. So it was, again, a variety of experiences. Um, the, when the war began, remember that America was 13 separate colonies with 13 separate governments. And they'd all agreed to work together to fight this war, but they didn't have a comprehensive system for how to do things like handle prisoners of war. You capture men in Connecticut, what do you do with them? Do they stay in Connecticut or do they get sent to some other colony? What happens if a man gets captured in New Jersey early in the war and then the place where he's held gets overrun by British troops later in the war? Do we send him to Pennsylvania? What? And these things were, were challenging for the American side to work out. There's some good writing about that. But it all gets into ultimately how the British soldiers were treated as prisoners. And again, you find a lot of different experiences. It's hard to just give a singular response to a question like that. All right. All right. One last question for you, John. What got you interested into this, into studying this so deeply in the first place? Oh, that's a great question. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I liked reading military biographies and autobiographies. I liked reading firsthand accounts of people who were at war, most of it World War II. But I eventually got interested in the American Revolution. And, and for some reason, I find the professional armies more interesting than the, the nascent armies or the irregular armies. So you look at the American Revolution and the, the British army, they were the professional army. They had, for the time period, they had all the best technology, they had the cool uniforms, they had all the really well-established procedures. And for me, that's kind of a draw. That just is what I find interesting to study. Nice. So then I want to have the first-hand accounts. What did the people in the army actually say? And I found it hard to find things like that. There wasn't a lot. There are some published writings of officers but not very much about what the common soldiers experienced. Well, I had the good fortune with timing and other things to get involved in archival research, actually when I was still a teenager, and, and was amazed by the information that can be found if we just look for it, and that can be assimilated. Um, this book is full of names of individual British soldiers and things that happened to them. Well, there's no one place you can go and find all that stuff in one place. You have to go here to get the names and then here to find some of the experiences and then find fragments from all over and eventually pull them together, and which is why I wrote a book. Um, but I found early on, I just wanted to see what about these individual people and recognize that there wasn't any singular place to go find the kind of information I wanted. And I was lucky enough to know people who would tell me how to approach this as a problem to be solved and where, where to start looking for the information. All right, that is excellent. Thank you so much. This has been very interesting. I think we've all learned a lot tonight. We want to thank the James and Edith Spain Foundation for sponsoring these History Camp discussions. And to find out how you can be a sponsor or join the Pursuit of History as a member, you can go to the Pursuit thepursuitofhistory.org. Next week, February 25th, we'll be talking with historian and author Maurice Isserman about the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division, whose elite soldiers broke the last line of German defenses in Italy's mountains in 1945 and spearheaded the Allied advance in 
into the Alps in final victory. So we hope you'll join us for that. Have a good night. Thank you, Don. Thank you.